Hey, hey, welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Amazon Files brought to you by Mommy Income. I'm your host, Kristen Ostrander. And today I wanted to do a little bit of reflection because as some of you guys might know, Mommy Income just turned nine years old uh, this past week. And that is crazy to think about to me. Um, some of you guys have been here a short time and some of you have been here the whole time with me. So I thank you for that. Um, just nine short years ago is when I decided that I was going to start a podcast and start maybe giving some insights and teaching and training and helping people with their Amazon businesses. That is how Mommy Income was born. So if you have only been here for a short time, I am going to kind of reflect and, and go back a little bit and talk about um, how I got started, why I got started, and what that means for you, and what you can take away from that, uh, knowing that that your career, your actions, your entrepreneurship are, is going to take many, many twists and turns. It's never predictable. That is one thing that we can count on when it comes to an entrepreneurial journey is that nothing is predictable. There's always going to be change. There's always going to be pivoting. Um, what you start out doing doesn't always end up what you finish doing. And that's normal and acceptable. And I think the straight line success story is such a myth, but yet we see all of these amazing Instagram posts and we see the highlight reels, right? Reels and, and videos and things like that. People generally aren't showing the days where they are in utter despair and they're ready to quit and they're they're just one keystroke away from going back to their old job or looking for a new one or pulling their hair out and throwing their laptops out the window y'all that's me at least once a week i'm just gonna be honest and i bet if you ask any entrepreneur and they're honest with you they will say they feel like that often. Most entrepreneurs feel like imposters, feel like you've heard of imposter syndrome, right? It's where you really feel like you're not worthy, you're not qualified. Any moment someone's gonna quote unquote, find you out and realize that you are um, not what you said you were or not what it's all cracked up to be, or they're gonna learn that this Amazon thing or this e-commerce thing is really a scam and a sham. And you know, you're just pretending to be an entrepreneur. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like, gosh, what am I doing here? I have no clue what I'm doing. I'm like a, like a, you know, the blind leading the blind kind of thing. You're just, you feel like some days you just really have no clue what you're doing. That's like impo that's imposter syndrome. And that's not really what this episode is about, but that's something that's very real. That's not really talked about a lot, especially um, in the e-commerce space, right? Like we're not really a lot of us. I mean, I'm a podcaster and a speaker, but most of you are not. Most of you are behind the scenes, hustling and grinding and working and reworking and doing all the things that you need to do to keep your e-com business afloat. And you're not really out necessarily in the public eye or you're not doing a podcast or anything like that, or maybe you are, but you still have that imposter syndrome inside of it. There's something inside that just keeps saying to you, you're not good enough. You're not where you're never going to get this right. You're not smart enough. So-and-so is going so much faster than you. Why aren't you getting it? There's a whole, that's imposter syndrome. I'm just really thinking you're not worthy. You're not capable. You're not all these things. And this is just the lies that, 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 the enemy tells us constantly. Now, I know you guys know um, that I'm a Christian. I'm a God girl. So I'm always um, looking at the, the world through that view, that through that lens, unapologetically. Um, if that's not for you, that's cool. I'm not pushing it on you. I'm not forcing you to, to think and believe the way I am. But understanding my viewpoint and understanding um, my worldview makes it just understanding where I'm coming from when it comes to that. I believe that there is a true enemy of our souls and there he, it, the Bible says that he's constantly prowling around looking for someone to destroy. So when I say the enemy, that's what I mean, an enemy of our faith, an enemy of our souls who is constantly lying to us. It says that in the Bible that the um, devil is the deceiver and the author of evil and the, um, the enemy of our souls. 
And so um, just to clarify that, uh, that's where a place where I'm coming from. So when I say that these lies are coming at us, that's what I mean. The lies from the enemy that are telling us we're not good enough, that we're not capable, that we're never going to achieve that thing, or we're never going to get there. But those are just lies. And I think imposter syndrome is really what that is. The lies that, that we're trying to believe in our head because there's another side of us that's scared of success. We're scared that if we do achieve what we want to achieve, what will that mean? And what happens if we lose that and we, we attain it and then we can't maintain it and then we lose it and the whole world is going to laugh at us and say, oh, ha ha, yeah, you got there, but it wasn't good enough or you couldn't sustain it or, you know, this and this. When really, no one says you have to. Even if you arrive at a place or achieve a goal or say you write a book or, or you know, just something like that, something that you want to achieve that, that you finally achieve. It's just something that you've got to think about. To, to, there's always going to be doubts and negativity. And we always think when we do something and achieve something that we're going to arrive at this special place that will finally feel qualified, that we will finally feel like, oh, yeah, this is the success. When really... It's just about the journey because we can reach milestone after milestone after milestone, but we were created for the journey. We will never arrive. That's the real truth that no one likes to talk about is that no matter how many millions of dollars you make or best-selling books you release or how many podcast episodes that you have or how many products you've sold or maybe your product ends up in, as being a household name and it's on Oprah's favorite things show and like all these different things. We are created to create. We are created to constantly be on a journey. That's why people write book one and book two and book 14 that's what they're meant to do, constantly creating and improving. And as our worldview changes and as we grow up and grow in wisdom and we grow in mistakes and we learn from them, um, our, our perspective changes over time. So there is no arrival. I hate to burst anyone's bubble who thought that. I thought that. I'll be honest, I thought that. I, for a long time, I thought, when I get to this place, when I get to this number, when I get to all of my debt being paid off, when I get to this body weight, when I get to this age, always longing for the someday, for that next big goal. And y'all, we're gonna talk about goals because that's one of the things that we're reflecting on today. Um, after being in e-commerce for 20 years, years this is my 20th year just so you know in, in my career my co career i always joke about that i'm like is this really a career like that's such a weird word to me because entrepreneurship or um you know careers i think of more of people you know starting at the bottom as an intern and then working their way up to the ceo office you know i don't know what kind of lofty ideas and things like that we've all grown up in different places and different expectations but it seems like gone are the days like of our parents, maybe, or maybe some of you who are um, a little bit older than me, um, where someone goes to a job and they stay there for 40 years and they have this wonderful retirement party and, and they get their pension and they move on. But in today's fast paced, ever changing society, people might do a job for two or three years and then realize, oh, I can change and do something else and I can change and do something else to where that was unheard of a couple decades ago or even, um, you know, during our, our parents time or, you know, whatever that is, the early you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, even 80s, where people are like, yeah, go to a corporate world and, you know, <clears throat> make a couple hundred grand and, you know, retire in Florida and have a nice life. Um, gone are those days. But yet some of that still follows us around as if we have to stay doing whatever it is that we're doing. And even being in e-commerce for 20 years, so many things have changed even from the beginning till now. And so many things are going to change even more. And I think removing that expectation that we have to do the same thing over and over and over again and stay in the same career or stay in the same business um, is, is a lot more common now than it that used to be. But there's something to be said about staying the course if it's aligned with what you want and what you're doing. Thinking about the journey that you want to have. Because I will tell you this, 
you're not stuck. You're not stuck. The world will tell you your own brain is going to lie to you and tell you you're stuck. Or I'm just stuck here. I can't pivot. I can't do anything else. I don't know what else to do. Or, you know, if I do this or if I do that, I'm, I'm going to be stuck. I'm stuck. You're not stuck. You always have choices. You always have choices. Sometimes the choices are between bad and worse. And sometimes the choices are good and better. But choices nonetheless. So reflecting on 20 years of e-commerce experience and nine years of teaching and training and helping, I've had a lot of reflections. There's been a lot of, you know, firsts and, and lasts and a lot of firsts. It happens all the time. Your first sale, right? Do you remember the joy of your first sale? When you started and opened your business, no matter how long ago that was, whether that was last week or a decade ago, you remember that first sale that you put in the effort, you put in the work, you put in the time, you learned something new, and you actually made a profit from something. Those are feelings and emotions and part of our journey and milestones that we don't forget. We all have a timeline. We all have a past timeline and one that goes into the future into an unknown date. And so it's really important to kind of look at how far you've come, no matter how long your journey has been. And so a time, I always do this on my birthday too. My birthday is actually the same day as Mommy Income's birthday. Um, that was intentional. When I first started my show and I started in 2014 uh, doing a live show, live stream. Um, we live streamed our my podcast for... I want to say three years before we went to more of a podcast version of pre-recorded and things like that. But for three straight years, live stream every Monday night, I live streamed for three years, the occasional vacation, occasional holiday off. But for the most part, almost every single week since 2014, nine straight years been podcasting. It was one of the things I committed to in the beginning. I never wanted to make a single dollar at first. I just committed to sharing my ideas and helping and answering people's questions in a live stream. Nine years ago, 534 episodes. That's like a rough estimate, but it's been over 500 now for, the, for the, this whole year. First podcast, first live stream was 33 people. 33 people were with me on that live stream. And now growing up to over 10,000 on YouTube and 30,000 a month listening. Thank you guys for listening. Um, I wouldn't do this if you weren't listening. I mean, doesn't really, I mean, does it benefit me? Sure. Yeah. I like to listen to myself talk. No, actually I do. <laughs> I'm preaching to myself as much as I am to you guys every time I turn on this camera and, and um, turn on this microphone. It's something I need to hear. Why? Because we all need encouragement and motivation and some tough love. And when I speak it to you, I speak it to me. But you know, in this journey, there's a lot of firsts, first sales, followed by first refunds. Everybody remember their first refund? Oh, so disappointing, right? There's highs and there's lows. Your first home run bundle and your first dud bundle. Yeah, have those. First six figure year. First six figure month. First five figure loss. Never forget that one. The thing is, is that this is part of the journey. And what's most profound is I was recently interviewed on a podcast episode, and I'll share that with you guys um, and on the social. So if you're not connected to social, mommyincome.com forward slash subscribe. And make sure you hit the little bell on YouTube to make sure you get notifications um, that you're downloading or following or subscribing, all the different stuff, because you're going to drop some of these things. But recently I was interviewed and someone kind of asked, oh, my gosh, you know, let's talk about your success. 
um, you know, what are the keys to your success and how have you gotten to the place? And so first of all, you know, let's, let's go over that. I'm just going to just going to reflect on a couple of milestones um, in this 20 year career that I've had so far in e-commerce and in um, education space. Um, digital course creation. I don't know what the heck it's called. Who cares? Um, it doesn't really need labeling. All I know is that it's been constant learning, improving, analyzing, pivoting, and changing. In 2003, I started selling on eBay with used clothing and toys of my children's. Followed shortly thereafter by dollar store. I had no idea it was even called arbitrage at the time. Uh, I went from selling my kids stuff to going to the dollar store and finding name brand uh, DVDs back in 2004. Y'all, that's how long ago it was. That was 19 years ago. <laughs> uh, from Dollar Tree. I remember these guy um, like yoga DVDs and they were selling for $15 a piece. And I just thought I had hit pay dirt. I went to every Dollar Tree I think within a hundred miles of me with two young children, one in a baby bucket seat and the other a rambunctious toddler. And I went and got every single DVD they had from every single Dollar Tree um, within a reasonable distance for which for me with that many kids was about a hundred miles. Started art, art, doing arbitrage. I had no idea what it was called. I just knew that these were selling for a dollar at Dollar Tree and I could get 15 bucks for them on eBay. And that was enough for me to chase them around. Uh, full, sold my very first item on Amazon in 2008. It was a used book. Then, you know, fast forward a couple of years, 2010, I really had some success in those first couple of years on Amazon with eBay. Uh, took on some partners that wanted to partner and like grow this thing huge. And that turned into some shady embezzlement and I had to start over. In the midst of that, my husband was injured from work um, he hurt his shoulder. He had to have, he was off. He had to have multiple surgeries and um, physical therapy to regain his strength and to be able to do, he's a commercial carpenter, so he needs that shoulder to do his work. And that was actually a time where it was a very dark time for us. We ended up losing our home to foreclosure because a lot of people think that um, when you get hurt, that workman's comp just swoops in and sends you checks while you sit on the couch and, and get well. And that is absolutely not the case. And there's a lot of more involved than, than people think. Um, so yeah, we lost our home to foreclosure and pretty much started over in 2014 with nothing. The, the, the partners uh, embezzled so much money from the company, we basically had to start over. Um, there was, of course, lots of repercussions from that, but we literally in January of 2014, even though I had been in e-commerce for so long already, uh, even in Amazon, basically had to start over with 1100 bucks. And we had built a pretty healthy business up until then. First wholesale account, 2014 was a great year, actually. Uh, looking back, um, I actually do this. Like, did you guys know that this is not just me, like, spitting a bunch of stats at you? Like, I actually go back and look. Briefly, because I'm not one of I'm not a past dweller. I'm not one of those that really camps there and thinks about the past a lot and things. Um, I learn from stuff. I try to learn from mistakes and move forward. And I think about it just as a milestone. Look back at what happened and what did I learn from that and what kind of time was that? What kind of because the hindsight is always 2020, right? Looking back, you can go, oh, now I see why that happened. Now I see how I probably had to go through that in order to arrive at the place I am today. So looking back really helps, but not just always looking back at the bad things and mistakes, which are great because we don't want to repeat them, right? Um, but looking back 2014, although started very dismal and like, hey, here we are starting over with barely anything. Um, but we also, that was the first year we opened our first account, wholesale account. And the first bundle that we ever released was that year. Um, so starting over with nothing led us somewhere. And that's one of the keys to my success that I wanted to share with you guys today. Um, this came out in this interview that I did, um, is that some of the best times are sparked from some of the worst times. When that those partners embezzled, we built quite a thing. And when those partners took all of that money and ran with it and had no apologies and no ways to make amends and basically just left you with nothing, that's devastating and hard, especially when people that you trust. But the pieces can be repaired. You got to pick them up and you got to move forward. 
Because some, some things happen to us and some things happen through us. And we don't often get that choice. COVID happened to all of us. No matter what, we didn't get a choice. But we do get a choice in how we respond and how we react and how we prepare. So after that whole horrible year of the shady embezzlement and the money being gone and starting over with like, where do we go? What do we do now? We, we, we had already had lost our home to foreclosure and we're trying to rebuild that and trying to rebuild our, our lives. And um, it was kind of a starting over period. Um, but the truth is that when you've got nothing, you've got nothing to lose. And that's actually a great place to be sometimes. It's a great place to be because there's not a lot of fear involved. It's just doing it and getting it done and every little bit helps and every little bit counts. And when you're in a place where every little bit helps, it changes your perspective. It makes what you have enough and it makes a small step forward every single bit of triumph. Twenty fourteen was a good year. It was our starting over year, but it was also the year that mommy income was born. During that year, sharing on Facebook and then someone saying, Hey, come be part of our live stream. We want to ask you questions. And then from that, I had people coming out of the word woodwork, DMing me constantly, like, Hey, I saw you on the show. I want to hear more from you. Do you have a question? Do you have an answer to this? Do you have a question to this? And I realized I had built up so much knowledge of selling online and selling on Amazon specifically during that time that I had a lot to share. And people asking me and me being able to answer those questions put this light bulb in my head that said, hey, I have something to offer. And in 2014, Mommy Income opened and was born. And now you see what it is today. Lots of firsts, even after that. The first prep center transition. And let me tell you, that was not an easy transition at first. I'll be honest. It was scary and hard. I ignored Nathan like for six months. He called and he texted and he emailed and he was like, hey, I really want to do this prep center thing. And I really think that you could help me out here. And I wanted to prep your inventory for free. And I was like, get lost. Who are you? <laughs> um, actually, he's a very kind and amazing person. I'm so thankful that he um, was very persistent in, um kind of knocking on my door. Um, we had met at an Amazon meetup at some point and, um, you know, we were like almost instantly kindred spirits. I feel like he's like my brother from another mother. Um, I often joke even that Nathan's like almost me, except for in a male form. <laughs> I don't know. We have a lot, a lot of similarities. Um, but, you know, Nathan is like, it's like my brother. And I can't imagine uh, now doing life without a prep center. But then it seemed like such a big deal, such a big transition to be able to trust someone else with my precious inventory, especially my bundles. I mean, these were mine and I wanted to make sure that someone was going to take as good care of them, packaging and shipping them as I would. And then the moment that was off my plate, it's like the weight of the world lifted off my shoulders and my creative brain was able to go from creative to creative rather than like shipping isn't creative to me. Shipping is just task oriented to where creativity is such a different thing when you're tapping into that side of your brain and you're creating a bundle and you're doing some research and then, then doing something more like like shipping. It was a really big transition for me. I had to do those things on completely separate days. I couldn't be creative and also be very tactile, um, hands-on shipping at the same time. It just didn't work for me. And so that was just another big transition that in the moment felt like a huge obstacle. And I couldn't, for the first six months and he was bugging me, I couldn't see the benefit on the other side. I could only see the obstacles and the what ifs and the, well, what if they screw this up? And what if they do this? And what happens here? And what happens there? And what if they close down? And what if I don't like it after a couple of years and I have to do it back at my own house? All the what ifs, they came in. And finally, we started really small. We said, you know what? We'll let you do one bundle 
of ours. And we had multiple, multiple bundles at this point. We were shipping out of our home. We were having pallets delivered like three times a week. We were receiving pallets and like breaking them down and bundling them and resending them out. And it was just basically had a warehouse at my house. I don't know how exactly we did this, <laughs> but looking back is interesting. That transition changed everything. You want to know one of the single most important decisions we made in business that changed everything that went from six figures to seven. That is really how we got there was using a prep center. Once we got prep and ship off of our plate, we were so much more free. When I say we, I don't know if you guys know my mother um, in 2014, uh, actually a couple of years before that joined my business um, when I was doing retail arbitrage. She was very interested in the shopping aspect. She loved shopping. She ended up um, coming aboard and doing retail arbitrage. And then throughout our transition from wholesale into wholesale bundles, she had been there the entire time. My mom has been with me now for over 10 years um, doing Amazon bundles and Amazon with me. So when I say we, I mean my mother and I, we are a business team and we work side by side with each other remotely. Um, we work together once a week, uh, sometimes twice, but for the most part we're remote. And uh, when I say we, that's who I'm referring to. So for those of you guys that don't really know us or our story, our FBA Amazon store is my mom and I, and that goes back over 10 years. Um, so when I say we, when we got prep and ship off of our plate, that gave us the space to be creative and really dig in on product research and putting bundles together. And that was the difference between um, a six figure year and a seven figure year because right after the prep center and they took over and then they, they took over the first bundle and they did amazing. And so we're like, here's more and here's more. And by the time we outsourced all of our prep and pack and ship, which wasn't very long. It only took them a month or two for us to realize, wow, this is a game changer. And that was the difference. That was one of the major differences is relying on other people because you can't do it by yourself. You can do it by yourself for a time. And if you keep it small and you keep it intimate and you're never overwhelmed and you're never burned out, then you can do it all on your own. I tried. I promise I tried. I tried to do everything. I am, y'all, I am so independent. I have been independent, I swear, from birth. Like, it is just part of me. I've always been like, let me do it myself. Let me try it myself. I can, you know, my dad raised me up um, to say, if you want something done right, do it yourself. Now, I don't necessarily subscribe to that anymore. But for many, many years, my determination was, and my motivation was that that I was responsible and I needed to take care of business and no one was going to do it for me. And I needed to step up to the plate and take care of it because no one was going to swoop in and rescue me. And you know, all these things, not, not, not that the help is not a problem. I had to learn in business to depend on and rely on other people because for so many years I tried to do it myself and you're only one person. I don't care if you're the smartest and best person in the world, you are still only one person with 168 hours in a week and you cannot do it all on your own. Let that sink in. I know that's hard for some people. It was hard for me. I am so independent. And let me say, like, y'all know I don't like the word stubborn, right? Um, it's a real world word, and I claim that, but I claim it as determined instead of stubborn. I am determined to get there, to reach that, to do better, to honor myself and others. Determined, not necessarily stubborn. But what I was determined to do in the beginning was just do it all myself. I can do this. I can learn this. The reality was that was hindering me. And the moment I let go of trying to do it all myself, the more I grew. It's like revolutionary. It was at the time anyway. And I didn't have a lot of people speaking into my life. I didn't have a lot of negativity necessarily. I, I've always had a support system. I, my husband has always supported anything that I've wanted to pursue and wanted to do. And um, that freedom has allowed me to grow and flourish in many ways. I don't take that for granted. I know that we don't all have a strong support system, but it's available to you. We have a community that will support you. I will be supporting you. And there's lots of positive and encouraging things out there to help you feel supported in, in and on your journey, whatever that means. 
community is available to you. Help and support is available to you, even if it doesn't happen in your own four walls. I just want you to know that if you have any, if you, if you need any sort of support or anything like that, reach out to me. I'll be happy to help you and direct you in the right direction of the type of support you might need. But that definitely has to be part of the success factor and letting go of thinking you can do all of it on your own. Outsourcing my prep was actually the easiest step and the one that made the biggest impact in my business specifically in business. It also made a huge impact on me because I realized, wow, I don't have to do it all. And when I don't, I actually do more. I get more done. I get more done of the stuff I really love to do. Like product research. I know, please don't roll your eyes at me. I love product research. I like to look at different products and I like to research them and read the reviews and figure out what customers are wanting and needing and provide that need. Why? Because you're filling gaps in the world. That's what you're here for. You know that, right? Do you know that's what you're here for? That out of all the things that God decided that the world needed one of you and that you have a purpose here to fill in the gaps, right? Just needed you to hear that today. We cannot do it all ourselves. We're not created to do it all ourselves. We're not expected to do it all of ourselves. And if you've ever put that own expectation on yourself, hello me, you are released from that in this very moment. You are not expected to carry the weight of the world. It's not your responsibility. You do have responsibility for yourself, but that's not it. It's not the whole everything all the time. And we only have an illusion of control. Control is an illusion. I thought I had control over my inventory and if I did it and my mom did it and we both spent the time and money and energy to make sure everything was just perfect and good and right, no one else could screw it up, then it was either pass or fail on us. But that's just an illusion because things can go wrong even when you do them, right? <laughs> For sure. They still go wrong even when I do them. So what better to do than trust someone else to be really good at what they're doing? You trust your surgeon, you trust your doctor. Why? Because you aren't one and they are, and they've gone through the training and they have the experience and they have the practice. So you put your trust in them to do a surgery or send you the right medicine or the right treatment because you trust their experience and their knowledge and their expertise. Would you ever try to stitch yourself up thinking, oh, I got this, I can handle this? No. We trust people around us. No success is built in a bubble. It takes years and lots of change and lots of humility and lots of learning from mistakes. We don't learn in the successful moments. The successful moments are there to prove that we have learned. The successful moments come when we've learned something. And learning something generally comes from the hard times, the difficult times, the challenges, the obstacles, the roadblocks, because it forces us to figure out a different way, to change and pivot by choice or by force. We are going to change. It's just things I want to contemplate with you alongside of you because you have your own journey. You know, gone through that in 2017 when I outsourced my prep and then 2018 was my first million dollar year. Never in a million years would you have asked me 20 years ago if I was gonna make a million dollars. I'd be like, oh, wouldn't that be nice? I would have laughed at you because that was never my goal. I mean, it's a great goal and I'm glad I got there. But that was never my goal. My, ne my goal was always just to be a little bit better than before, to take small steps towards a direction. I will admit some of my weakness, my mistake, my whatever. Um, I'm not a long-term planner. Never have been. I actually struggle with long-term planning. When I say long-term planning, I mean, like, when someone asks me in an interview, like, where do you see yourself in five years? I want to punch them in the face. <laughs> 
<laughs> I know I'm laughing at myself because I know if you could imagine me, I would never punch someone in the face. Um, but like, that's the whole idea. Like I get like nervous and anxiety and anger inside of me when someone's like, tell me what your life looks like in five years or what would you like to have in five years? I'm like, I don't know. Like five years is a long time and a lot of things can happen between now and then. How about like one year that I can kind of see in one year. I'll be this age and I will, you know, probably still be living here and probably, no, but five years from now just feels so far away because I want to enjoy the moment now. We aren't promised or guaranteed five years. That doesn't mean we don't plan for that. I mean, I have a retirement account. Why? Because I'm hoping one day that I will retire and I have, you know, things I'd like to do and things like that, but I'm just, it's flexible. It's very flexible. It's not rigid and straightforward because I've already learned that the path towards anything you want is never a straight line. There's ups and downs and twists and turns and things that you won't anticipate or could predict. So building that in, it's difficult for me to try to think of in five years, where do you imagine your life, your business, your, your relationship, your anything? Anybody else struggle with that? So when some, you know, when someone asked me now, have you ever could have imagined this? Actually, no. I mean, if it was my choice and my plan, I would have built a straight line to success because that would have seemed the easiest thing. Step one, step two, step three, step four, step five, ta-da, million dollars. <laughs> I laugh because that is so, so, so opposite of what really happens. What really happens? You ever play shoots and ladders as a kid? You get so close to the top. And you're like, oh, I'm doing okay. And you hit the ladder and you're like, yeah, climb, climb, climb. Oh my gosh. And there's one that like goes all the way up to like 87 and you're almost at that hundred and you're close by. And then right before you get there, the slide that takes you all the way back to like step one or step 10. And you're like, man, that is so much more real life than anything else. Go play shoots and ladders. <laughs> That is like the business journey success, right? You go up, you go down, you slide around, go back two spaces. Um, your friend kicked you in the teeth and now you have to slide down the ladder and go to the doctor or whatever it is. Like, it's such a, such a real life experience. And eventually someone wins the game. You know, somebody does get there. You will get there, but not without expecting that there are going to be shoots and ladders along your journey. Making my first million dollars. I didn't even realize how close I was that year. Until I was like, oh my gosh, this is actually really within reach. And then I started pushing more towards it. It was never something I chased. It was just like, let's make this year better than the last. I don't really like to set number goals. Because what I think we really want is to grow. They're created to grow and learn and develop. Leaving the old behind, embracing the new, embracing the, oh, you know, tell me one thing, you know, think about this for yourself. You know, but something that has changed in your life over time, a person that maybe you used to be that you're not anymore. We all have those days because we all used to be teenagers. <laughs> right? I promise you're not the same person you were when you were 14. I'm saying 14 because like it's such an awkward time of life to be alive. 13 and 14. It's just 15. It's like just those years where you're like, who am I? Where do I fit in? What do I want to be? What don't I want to be? You know, all kinds of different stages and phases. And sometimes that's really when we solidify and decide who we want to be. But I know that there's parts of you that are no longer there. You've changed, you've grown, you've evolved, you've rediscovered. And that's perfectly okay. That's actually what we should do as adults living in the world. We learn something new and it changes our perspective. The first time you ever really lose somebody that you care about, it changes you forever changes you forever if you have to learn to live without someone you were really close to. So we've all been growing and changing over the years. And we can try to do everything to prevent growing and changing and having everything try to be controlled around us so that we don't have to experience something new. But why? Why do we do that? Why do we want to do that? And there's nothing but hope 
an adventure, if that's what we're looking for. We are going to change. The sooner we embrace that, the easier it becomes to do. And one of the ways to do that is to look back at all the change in your life. Some good, some not so good, but change nonetheless. And who are you now that you've gone through that? Let's just rewind a few years. Who are you now versus pre-COVID? We have this milestone in our life now that we can say pre and post COVID because life did change. Just like in 9-11, things changed forever. Things changed. How we go to airports, how we view airplanes, how we view each other. How do we handle times of crisis? We are changed by everything we go through. It's up to us whether we allow that to change us for the better or keep us stuck in the same thinking patterns that we did before. Lots of transition can happen. 20 years of a career in e-commerce. 20 years. I never would have imagined that when I first started selling on eBay. I was just a young mom trying to make a few dollars to buy the next toy or the next thing because money was scarce. Y'all, for those of you who don't know, I got married at 19. I had my first child when I was 20. I had my second child when I was 22. Then I had my third child when I was 29. <laughs> but still, like, that's pretty young. I look at my kids now today who are 23 and 20, my older kids, and I'm just like, I cannot imagine them being married and having children right now. Like, <laughs> I look back and go, oh my gosh, at your age, I was wrangling a toddler and a newborn. <laughs> my son just turned 23. So we just had this conversation and it was just like a, you know, just kind of an eye opener when you look at those things, like all the things that I've learned throughout this time transitions and pivots and you know pre and post COVID now we don't even talk about that I never imagined before that I would write a book and that I would publish a book like a real book but here it is 2019 published a book the first of several stay tuned <laughs> I know you're like wait a second what'd she say <laughs> um yeah the first of several I have other books cooking in the works um you know just the different things that you go through looking and reflecting reflecting on all those things and then saying okay for the next 20 years what would i like my life to look like what are some steps i can take right now today to get closer to whatever that is because everything's a season what i have learned in my 20 years of e-commerce Obstacles will absolutely come, period. You're going to have challenges. You're going to have obstacles. You're going to have roadblocks. You're going to have devastation even. I know. Spoiler alert. I, I know, you guys. I know. I hear voices. I hear people, like, clicking the next button because they're like, oh, she's, like, doom and gloom. Y'all, I'm not doom and gloom. You know better. But I am tough and I am real. Why? Because that's the stuff that helps. It doesn't help always, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an encourager, so I get it, like encouraging words and positive affirmations and speaking life and praying over people and all those things. I absolutely always agree with that and do it like that's actually part of who I am. But I'm also very realistic because if we don't face the realistic life expectations and just things that happen, we're going to be constantly shocked and disappointed. Life is short and full of trouble. We are to expect that, but the answers and the solutions are everywhere. Most problems are solvable, most. Defeat is optional. It's absolutely optional. If you give up, if you quit, if you throw in the towel, if you decide, you know, that's defeat. Or maybe surrender. That's also an option. But defeat is optional. If you want something and you want to move towards it, your determination can be unstoppable. If you expect obstacles and they don't shock you and they don't surprise you, you shouldn't be shocked. If you work with Amazon at all, if you're selling on Amazon, which most of you are because this is the Amazon files, right? If you sell on Amazon at all, 
you understand that obstacles come probably every day. Every day there's a notification or something you have to fix or a listing that was taken down or some sort of brand something or your, your stuff didn't come on time or there's a lost shipment or you lost money or something's discontinued or you get suspended. You get suspended. That's all. I've been all, through all of that. Pivoting is an absolute must. You're going to pivot many, many, many times, probably this year. Pivoting doesn't always mean a full 180. It might be a slight degree turn in a different direction, a similar path. Maybe your bundle turns into a bigger private label brand than you expected, and now Amazon's knocking at your door asking for a $10,000 order. Or maybe your brand is taken down because it's so similar to someone else's that you can't even predict what it's like. There's a key to some of this. Number one is reevaluating it, knowing yourself and what you need to thrive. Because sometimes business is all just about survival. We're keeping our doors open. We're keeping the, the doors from shutting. We're like, um, we're, we're one um, order away from, you know, total devastation. That's a possibility. That was COVID for us. When Amazon was like, nope. You're not essential. You can't send anything into FBA. That was a huge, huge blow to our business, period. For many, many of you as well. That happened to us. But we have an option to pivot, which we did instantly. Being ready, staying ready so you don't have to get ready. Staying ready. That requires some responsibility that requires some humility and understanding that like, I, if I'm going to be an entrepreneur, I understand much is given, much is required. With great power comes great responsibility, right? If you are going to be an entrepreneur, you automatically are stepping into the place of self-leadership. There is not a boss telling you what to do, when to do, how to spend your money, how to buy inventory this way or that way. No one is going to do it for you. You have decided that you are an entrepreneur. And that comes with its own set of rules and responsibilities. Sure, I don't have a boss telling me what to do. That's great, right? But at the same time, I don't have a boss telling me what to do. That means I have to decide how to spend the money, what products to buy, how to change my listings, what keyword tools I'm going to use, what prep center I might hire. Who's going to do my PPC, me or someone else? Who's going to do my packaging? You have to make all the decisions. With great power comes great responsibility. And you know that if you've been an entrepreneur for at least half a year, you've already get this. You're janitor and CEO. So knowing yourself and what you need in order to thrive and not just survive is really, really important. Self-awareness. What area do you struggle the most in? We all have struggles and weaknesses. That's where you hire people first. I absolutely despised shipping. And yet it took me months and months and months to talk to Nathan and finally get shipping off my plate. But I absolutely hated every day. When it was shipping day, I was like, oh, I have to package and ship and do box tape. Like that was the furthest thing from things that I want to do. I just uh, proclaiming it right now. Shipping is the worst for me. And some people, like, I don't know if you guys know Jason T. Smith from, like, the, the thrifting uh, secret beach, the thrifting board. Um, he's uh, thrifting with the boys and all that stuff. He's, he's very eBay-focused. Um, tiki mug guy. I'm sure a lot of you guys know him. If you don't, go look him up. He's amazing and funny and has a great group and things like that. Um, but he is one of those people, just like Nathan at the Prep Center, that loves the shipping, loves the process of seeing all these things and then seeing them packed up nicely and shipped out the door. The box tape and they're, oh my gosh, that's like the worst noise to me. So they can be, it's just somebody loves to do what you hate. I've said this in other shows before. There are somebody out there that loves to do what you hate. And that's the beautiful part about business is that you can do only the parts that you love and outsource the rest. And that is how you arrive at another milestone of success. <clears throat> Excuse me. I would never have been able to write my book and release it in 2019 if I was still doing my prepping, packing, and shipping. That was one of the reasons it got off my plate. And then I was like, wow, 
I have extra time. I'm going to put it more into creative bundles. And those creative bundles were thriving and did well. And then the next part of that was being able to have time to put my words into thoughts and writing my book. So it gives you so much more by taking certain things off your plate. It's also mental. It wasn't just physically off my plate that I didn't have to do this packing and prepping and shipping anymore, but it was also out of my mental space. It freed up my mind and my time and my energy to do something else that I loved, which then internally made me a better person, a happier person, a more fulfilled person, which then spills out to all the people around you. It makes the world a better place when you're a better person. And the only way to do that is to be aware of knowing yourself and how are you going to thrive? And let me ask you this, are you thriving now? No matter how long you've been here, my journey has been longer than most of you. But I don't care if you've been here for six months or six years or six minutes. Okay, if you're six minutes, we're gonna give you some time. <laughs> but seriously, are you thriving? And what's it gonna take for you to thrive? What is one thing that you could get off your plate to move more from survival to thriving? Because y'all, my goal never changed. My goal was never to hit a certain number or sell a certain number of products or have a certain number of subscribers, any of that stuff. My goal never changed. It still remains. I just want to make an income doing something I really enjoy. Because y'all, if we're really realistic, most of us will have to work for the rest of our lives or until we reti retire, whenever that is. For some people it's early, for some people it's late, some people never retire because they would do some things that they love so much, they couldn't imagine not doing them. That's what I want. I don't wanna say I'm retired, I wanna say I'm still doing the things I love doing. So I'm here for the long haul. I've always, that's what I wanted to do. That was my biggest struggle when I was trying to pick something to do when I realized I had to bring in some money when my kids were little and my husband was feast or famine. You know, that's just the kind of, you know, in Michigan, he's a commercial construction and there's just times when there's just really slow times, especially in downturned economic times, which has happened many times over our years. Layoffs are very common. And so we just have to be a double income household and that ebbs and flows and that's totally fine. But my whole point back in the day when I first started eBay is because I wanted to do something on my own terms. I wanted to make money doing something I liked doing. And at that time, I didn't know what that was, but I knew it was what it wasn't. I had been a waitress and that was okay. I liked the fast pace and the, and the people. I like people. I'm a people person in case you hadn't noticed. <laughs> I like to talk. I like to chat and never met a stranger. So that was an, a decent fit for me at the time, but it was also separating me from my family. My husband would come home and then I would leave and go to this restaurant job. And I was like, this is not how I want to spend my life. I have little kids at home. I want to be there for them when they wake up. I don't want to be super tired um, when, when they get up and, you know, little kids and stuff like that. So I'm like, I wanted to make money doing something I liked doing. So although I liked, I actually liked the pace and the the constant change and just the people and all that of, of um, being a waitress, but it wasn't on my own terms or my own schedule. And so I really wanted that. I always desired to work for everyone's benefit. I love collaboration. I love win-win situations. Um, when everybody's happy, I'm happy. I really like creating that kind of environment. And I wanted to just, the goal was never, it's still the same today. I still just want to make an income doing something I really love. So it just doesn't feel like work. It's like, oh, I get to do this today. I get to, not a have to. There are definitely have to days when I, you know, there's one day a week where I quote unquote, put all the fires out on Amazon, answer all the cases, follow up, do those sort of things. Um, you know, I don't love every aspect of everything I do, but for the most part, it's like a 90-10. Like I really, really enjoy um, coaching and teaching and training and uh, digging into research and creating products and creating bundles. That is just my jam. Um, 
And I also don't like to be told what to do. I like the freedom to make wise choices and to investigate and ask for help when I need it. But I don't love, it's not that I don't like authority. I just don't like being told like you must do this and you must show up at this time and do this thing. I like to voluntarily choose what's best for me. <laughs> and so I feel like I'm just a natural entrepreneur. Um, my husband jokes about it, that if I ever worked, you know, I always joke that I'm going to go work at Starbucks on my bad days. He's like, yeah, right. He's like, you're either going to get fired because they're going to tell you a bunch of stuff to do. And you're going to be like, no, that's dumb. We don't do things that way. <laughs> I mean, I would never call anybody dumb, but like the whole idea of like, I'm very efficient and I'm very practical um, and I'm very collaborative. And, you know, that doesn't always work at a place where someone wants to tell you what to do. They're like, this is how things are done. This is how we do things. If you don't like it, there's the door. So um, that, <laughs> I digress. I am I'm an entrepreneur through and through. Um, I've also been like super responsible and I didn't really need reminders. I knew, I don't know if I was raised this way or just part of me or whatever, but um, I knew once I know what's required of me and what's expected, like I step up to the plate and take care of business. Like, I don't need you to tell me what I'm responsible for. Like, I know that I'm, I'm once the expectations are set, like I understand. Um, but those things are all contributing factors to success. Um, another thing that comes along with this and comes along with with finding the success that you want, whatever that looks like for you, is being a good steward of your resources. Being a good steward of your resources. Um, when I first started my business, it was cash only. I only used cash. If there was not cash available to buy inventory, there was none purchased. No credit cards, no loans, no anything. And now the business is bigger. That's a totally different story. But the discipline that I placed on myself in the beginning has grown me leaps and bounds now that I have more money that I need to manage. So if you're a good steward with a little bit, you can be a good steward with a lot. So that's one of the things, time, money, and energy are your resources. No matter how much you have of each one of those, it's up to you to manage them manage your money your money money is just a tool it's just a resource whether you have fifty thousand dollars or five dollars you decide what what's done with that money in your business it's up to you and sure we're gonna make bad buys we're gonna make bad purchases we're gonna make hasty decisions we're gonna make mistakes expect that yep you heard it from me right here and now expect it you will make mistakes you're gonna lose money in business there's no guarantees, there's no promises. There's no promises that even ideas are gonna be the best ones. Plain and simple, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to have loss, sometimes big. And that's okay, because you will survive. If you continue to move forward and learn from mistakes and look to correct them and look to not repeat those mistakes, you will grow. One day you'll look back at your timeline and you'll say, oh, remember that really bad blunder, but look what happened because of that, right? How you manage and steward your money and time and energy. Energy, energy is important. Most of us in 21st century America have very limited energy because so much is demanded of us. If you're a mom and a business owner, psh, exponential. Not for my dad friends that that doesn't mean any harm there. I was raised by a single dad, so I understand that moms and dads, you know, I'm not claiming any sort of role here. I'm just simply saying most of the time, if you're a mom and a business owner, your responsibility is double most people. I know that from personal experience. It's been true in my own life. And self-imposed. I mean, it just is. When you're required, when you are caring for little humans, they can't care for themselves. That is your responsibility. That's a big responsibility. Another key determining factor in, in having success is determination, stubbornness, whatever you want to call it. I like determination. Um, it's a more positive word, but determination that baby steps are still steps. That if you are moving in the right direction towards your goal, it doesn't matter how fast. 
it matters that you're intentionally moving in a specific direction. So let me ask you, what specific direction are you moving towards? Is it a number? Is it a milestone? Is it a specific timeline or money? What is it? What steps are you taking and why are you taking them and where do you expect them to lead? That's like me. It's meeting goals and making new ones. Meeting goals. I never set out to make a million dollars. I set out to make 50 bucks so that I could buy an eBay book so that I could be more educated so I could do eBay better. That was one of my very first business goals. There was this book I wanted to read on eBay and I couldn't afford it at the time. It was $50 and to me that seemed like a lot of money. When it was between that $50 book or putting $50 of groceries on the table, groceries were winning every time. But I was determined that I was going to sell a few things so that I could save up for this $50 book so that I could improve my selling and maybe sell more than $50 book. And then it was, let's make my next $100. Let's make $1,000. Let's sell a $1,000 item, perhaps. Small, reasonable goals. Something that's like, hey, I can get there. It's going to take a little work and a little challenge, but I'm going to get there. And as soon as you get there, there's never this, oh, ah, like arrival. It's like, okay, what's next? Do you know we're built for what's next? We don't always get to know it. We don't get to see five or 10 years into the future. But we know we have today. That keeps you motivated when you set small goals that you can accomplish. I'll never forget those small goals. When someone told me I might have to write 50,000 words for a book, that felt overwhelming. And the first instruction was, write the first paragraph. That's all. That seemed, 50,000 words seemed like a lot. But writing a paragraph didn't seem like a lot. 14, 15 chapters seemed like unsurmountable task. And even when my editor told me I was going to have to write and then read and reread five times the same text, I was like, oh, I almost threw in the towel. I'm like, there's no way. Small, reasonable goals. Small, reasonable goals. The first paragraph turned into the first chapter, turned into the third chapter, then the fifth, and ongoing. Small, reasonable goals keeps you motivated. You know, it's like, you know, the perpetual carrot they dangle over your face all the time. You're like, okay, just follow the carrot. That's your reward. But the reward never actually comes. It does in real life. I'm all about treats and rewards, y'all. I like to work towards something that gives me a feeling of fulfillment and accomplishment. However you're motivated, that's great too. Sometimes people are motivated by, um, you know, putting money into a jar to save for something or some sort of visible, tangible thing. They're like, okay, every time I do this, I have this. Whatever motivates you, that's something that you're going to need. Know thyself. What, no, what inspires you to move? Planning is also part of the success. Now, when I say planning, I'm not a five-year planner into the future, but I do like to plan things. You know, we don't just come up with something the week before and then release it to the mommy income world. These things are planned for, for months on end. Lots of care is taken into trainings and podcasts and guests and social media and all of the things. Careful and intentional planning. Where do you want to go? What are you intending? What do you want to achieve and why your why is important just as ever go back a few episodes and listen to the why's setting your smart goals and the reasons because that needs to be enough because that that's part of the hunger that's what i've also realized over time in 20 years when i look back at some of the decisions that i've made in business a lot of it is because hungry people work to eat. And that's kind of a metaphor. But the whole point is when your back is against the wall and you have nothing else to do, 
and you're hungry, you will work. Will work. You know, you've seen, you know, people that have those signs, you know, the will work for food kind of thing. Yes, that's the exact thing. Will work for food. Will work for the life that I want. So that is, what are you hungry for? If you're finding yourself lackluster in your motivation and you're uninspired and you're depressed and you're bored or you're, you know, you've got all these problems and obstacles, what are you hungry for? Because hungry people work. I don't just mean work in business. I mean working on yourself. What are you longing for? What is it that you really want at the end of that day? Y'all, I encourage you to read Dream Big, Step Small. Get into chapter three and write your in a perfect world. No one's looking. No one's cheating. No one's looking at your paper. No one's going to analyze it for you. Just write your in a perfect world. What are you really, really after? So people are just like, oh, I just wanted a couple million dollars in the bank so I can retire from my job and do whatever I want. Great. Let's start there. Where are you now? And what are the obstacles that might be in your way to getting what you need? Because did you know millions of dollars are available to you? There's plenty of money in the world to go around. It's not scarce. But it's not handed over. So what are you willing to do? How hungry are you? And that doesn't mean you have to hustle and grind and work 24-7, seven, seven days a week to, to get what you accomplish. But there might be some of that that's required. I spent a lot of late nights and early mornings trying to get to my goal. And there are things that I've done in those late nights and early mornings that I'll never have to do again because I did the hard work then. And now it's just the benefits. But it didn't come without sacrifice. It didn't come without saying, this is what I want and this is the price I'm willing to pay because everything's going to cost you something. I know, more tough love. Did you want me to say everything's just going to be free and, you know, we're going to, you know, if you hit the lottery, one in a million, I suppose. But then again, more money, more problems. If you hit the lottery, you're going to have crazy ex-girlfriends and cousins and people coming out of the word work going, hey, you got millions. And then a bunch of people mad at you when you don't give it away. So don't think that that's going to solve your problems. But the room, it remains. What are you hungry for? And what are you willing to do to fulfill that hunger? that need, that desire, that goal. I remember back in the day, what I really wanted was peace and relief. We had a lot of debt. We made a lot of mistakes. We were young and didn't really know how to manage our money well. And then when times got hard, we didn't know what to do. And we had a lot of hardship and problems. Number one, it was just somewhat of an income problem. We we're a young couple with a couple of young kids just trying to make ends meet on our own. And that's difficult for anyone. But we were determined to have a better life. We were determined to do things for our kids that maybe weren't done for us. We were determined to be there for them. And because of that, I was willing to do what it took, pay the price of lack of sleep. And while everybody else was, you know, hanging out and doing this and that, I was working. Why? Because now I have that freedom and flexibility. I gave up some of that then to get it now and hopefully forever. So what kind of work are you willing to put in now so that you don't have to do it later? You know, I heard this quote or read it probably on Pinterest or something, a meme, I don't know, um, that was really, really impactful. And it's the same for your money. It's the same for your job. But this quote was re relative to health. It says, if you don't make time for your wellness, you'll be forced to make time for your illness. That's had such an impact on me in all of life. If you don't make time for your wellness, you'll be forced to make time for your illness. That could be worth money. If you don't make time for your wealth, 
and thinking about it and planning for it, eventually you will have no choice. So think about those things. What are you hungry for? What are you motivated with? What motivates you to keep moving forward? Because things will get difficult. In 20 years of e-commerce experience, in nine years of mommy income, I have learned a ton. I've learned what motivates me and I've learned what doesn't. I've learned how to delegate. I've learned how to spend wisely. I've learned to receive help and seek support. That comes with humility too. I'm very independent, but I also realize I don't know it all, nor do I want to. I'm going to lean on someone who's already learned it all over here or learned a lot about this and say, let me lean on your expertise. I don't know. And I just want, I also realize that leaning on people is a shortcut. They know they've made the mistakes. They've been there and done that. So let me learn from them so that I don't have to be there and done that the way they did. So intentional reflection really helps you to see where are you going? What are you doing? What do you want? How close are you to what that thing that you want exceeds? For me, it's always been peace. My driving and motivating factor is peace. You're overwhelmed and stressed out and burned out and maxed to the hills. That's the opposite of peace. So I'm looking at what's going to bring me peace. It brings me peace to know my bills are paid. So for many years, it was a struggle to pay the bills. So what brought me peace was to know I'm doing my best to contribute to my financial obligations. Not just the needs, but also the wants eventually. I was determined to have the peace of knowing we could provide for our family in a way that was comfortable for us and for them. It brings me peace. Peace in relationships. Peace knowing that we need to tell the truth and we need to be honest and we need to be upfront and we need to be authentic no matter what. That's going to cost you something too. For people that won't respect it. For people that won't, you know, if you don't tell them that everything's sunshine and rainbows, they're going to run in the opposite direction. I'd rather be honest than popular. So what's important to you? What are you hungry for? What do you want deep down? Because it's available. What you want really deep down, what motivates you and drives you is available. And there are simple steps to take in order to close those gaps. I've been able to close a lot of gaps and I'm so eternally grateful for that. That's why I show up every single day to motivate you and to myself and to learn and to grow and to change and to embrace it. Because if I've learned anything in my 20 years of experience with e-commerce and entrepreneurship is that change is inevitable and defeat is optional. I hope you can take that away today and really think to yourself, what am I hungry for? What's standing in my way and how can I close that gap one step at a time? If you don't have Dream Big Step Small, I encourage you to get it. It's on Audible. It's on a hard copy. I will mail one to you and sign it myself. If you go to mommyincome.com forward slash book, or you can go to my website. It's there as well. You can also buy it on Amazon. Um, it's on Kindle. So wherever you are, go and just take the small step to figure out what it is that you're hungry for. What it is that you want? What is your inner perfect world? And take one more step to close that gap. I'm here for you. I'm thankful for you. I wouldn't have a job if it wasn't for you. So thank you for allowing me the privilege to speak into your life every week on this podcast. And I look forward to many, many more years of sharing my thoughts and encouraging and a little hug and a slug with my tough love and my uh, realistic expectations here. Um, but I hope that it has served you well. And thank you for the privilege of being able to continue to serve you yet another year. So here's to cheers to many more years of, of mommy income and um, cheers to many more years for you, whatever that looks like for you. I don't take that for granted. Thank you guys so much for listening, for showing up every week, for showing up for yourselves. You deserve that. And I'm here to help you and inspire you and move you towards the success that you have been wanting. 
So thank you again for listening to the Amazon Files podcast. See you same time, same place next week on the Amazon Files.